All right, sorry. Uh, once again, from the top, uh, we started this program several years ago with the um, oncoming of Walmart. And the idea was to document the Dobson farm. So I went to Bob and Ann, who are sitting here with their family over here on the, on the left, and went to them and said, do you have any pictures? Well, luckily, Judge Dobson had kept a diary, and he had wonderful photographs to share with us. So all of this is from the Dobson family album, and Bob will be here to answer any questions that you might have as we go, as we go along. Um, we start with the Dobsons. They weren't the first ones to come here. The first ones to come here were the Sheridans. Now, how many people recognize the Sheridan ring? Nobody. Other than family, <laughs> they disappeared and moved to Boston. So there was a Sheridan family in downtown Rochester in the Third Ward, but other than that, the Sheridan name has been lost forever, except through the Dobsons. Um, because Mary Sheridan married Mr. Dobson. John Sheridan was the first one to come from Ireland, um, and he bought a farm on the corner of Denise Road and Dewey Avenue. He was followed thereafter by his sister Mary and her family in 1880. They came on July 12th and arrived at Castle Garden, which was the predecessor to Ellis Island. They came with six children, and on board the same ship, which we don't have any information about him or know what side of the family he belonged to, was Mary's aunt, uncle, Roger Farrell. He's buried in Mother of Sorrows. He died in 1905. So the six children are listed here, John, James, Jane. Frank would later become supervisor for the town of Greece, and um, he was a judge for 39 years? 28 what? years. 28 years. And um, then there was Mary and also Patrick. And my interest in Patrick was because I'm the archivist for Shalott High School, and he was the very first graduate, a class of one. When it became a union school, he was the only graduate in the class of 1893. In 1894, there were two girls that graduated. But Patrick, so the first person out of Shalott High School was a Dobson. So here are Frank and Martha with their three children in the summer of 1936. Um, and the kids are Mary, Robert, and Frank. And if you look over here to your left, you see little Bob. Oh, hi, and, and he's, he's, going, got, he's got a little less hair. hair and it's not curly anymore. <laughs> but there he is. Oh, that's fun. With mom and dad. Aww. Here's the 1902 map. And I think this, this does work. Okay. So um, here we have Dewey Avenue. And we have Clinton Avenue would become Denise Road. Okay, so here's the north side, Milk Tennyson and Christopher Tiernan. Um, this is Fleming Creek. My husband grew up on Shadow Brook Drive. So this goes to Shadow Brook and Ripplewood. And then here are the Dobsons on the corner. And the next one shows it a lot. Oops. A lot closer. I guess, I guess the other one doesn't have the close up. So... They're right here on the corner, the northeast corner. And we're going to see pictures of the farmhouse, which is no more. This is the picture of the farmhouse in 1902. This is the new place where it was moved from to this new location. So the original log cabin was located on Dewey Avenue. It was moved to the nice road. And you know what I was going to do? I don't know the number of this house. Roger, yeah, Roger's got, house. I got it, the number, but I... Yeah, it, it's right on the nice that. road. You can go by it there. It's a ranch house. And the reason why, Roger Dobson was an attorney in Shalott. And when he went to put siding on his house, they took the original siding up. They found the logs. It was such an early, early house. It was built by the Waters family, William Waters and his family. Um, in, the, in the 1820s or 1830s, as close it's as we can tie it. Because, 1823. Because we don't know exactly, because usually you can tell when somebody builds a house because their taxes will go up. Well, Luis only became a town in 1822. So we're talking very early and one of the very first settlers. Um, but here's the tenant over on the right-hand side showing how deep that wall was with the plaster that they put on the inside. It's a very bad... Re 
replica from the Times Union, but this was such a big deal that they put it in the in the Times Union newspaper when they discovered it. And it was actually taken down. Anybody from Shalott remember the Benvenuos? <coughs> the Benvenuos were in charge of doing it. And this is the story that goes along with that photograph, saying that the walls were unusually thick because they had the timbers of the log cabin that was built in the early 1830s. William Waters, um, Scuttlebutt's <coughs> restaurant at the corner of Ladder Road and River Street was William Waters. He was the village grocer. So he was down at that corner, and which is right across from the, today's Tape Time building, which is the Customs House belonging to the Lighthouse. So that's where he lived, and his business was down there, and he lived on the nice road. So this is the story of William Waters, and John Sheridan bought the property from William Waters. William Waters moved to Shalott. Here's a, a 1910 census showing Mary Dobson, her husband, had already uh, died, and she's got her four children living with her, along with her grandson, Roger. And Roger's the one who becomes the attorney later on. Here's a 1924 map, which shows that the Dobsons have now expanded their holdings. This is Dewey Avenue once again. They now own the east side and the west side of Dewey Avenue. And it was all orchards. So here it is in 1924. They started with 15 acres. Then they bought another 31 acres. Bought another 24 west of Dewey Avenue in 1886. So and that belonged to Bernard Colgan and his family. So they bought the Colgan farm. Now the wonderful part about Judge Dobson keeping, and, and your uncle too, right? He kept track of all of this. I don't know, oh, brother, I don't know who did it. Your brother, brother did the, the drawings? Okay, I wasn't sure which one of them. They actually drew where the buildings were on the property and what crops were grown and where they were. So we're going to have a close up of that right here on the next page that shows the barn. Okay, there's the, there's the house. The horse barn, and then another one. Dewey Avenue was over here, and this is the nice road. So you're looking south. North Gate would be here. Here's the original Dobson farmhouse, which I cry every time I see these old things taken down because what a beautiful house there was. And along with the photographs, there there is a piece which I'm going to read to you right off the, off the list here. Eventually, the Dobson family moved the old log cabin, probably around 1900, to this, farm, to this farmhouse on Denise Road. So they moved from the log cabin and built this house. It was originally located at the corner of Dewey Avenue and Denise Road and faced Dewey Avenue. In 1900, the Dobson brothers purchased a 33-acre farm, including the house and barn from Margaret Goodwin. The niece of widowed Ann Colgan, which we would never know who Ann Colgan was. We wouldn't know what family. So genealogy plays a lot to do with trying to find family history and who owns what property. If it weren't for this, we still wouldn't know her maiden name. Um, the second floor rooms all had adjustable floor vents, which would allow for rising heat from the main floor to enter these rooms. The kitchen had a large cast iron or wood-burning fireplace that was used for cooking and heating. There was also a well water hand pump by the sink. In time, public water and natural gas was piped into this house, and a gas cook stove was installed into the kitchen. Even with a new gas stove, Jane Dobson would often use the older stove to bake and do some of her cooking. Although the home had central heat, wood or coal was still burned in the old kitchen stove to keep warm. I remember when I was a little kid, my grandfather had his old coal burning stove down in the basement by the coal bin. And that's where he was allowed to cook the food that was not allowed to be cooked upstairs by my grandmother. So my job was to feed the coil coal into that uh, stove so that he could cook his goat's heads, you know, and the rabbits and all that stuff that my grandmother wouldn't allow upstairs. So I understand, and I'm not, I'm not that old, so we're talking the 60s and the 70s, still had the old coal burning uh, furnace yeah, down in the basement. Yeah, I might add too that this house, uh, like you said, s stood at the corner of Denise and Dewey Avenue, but there was a barn on the property that was on the same, uh, in the same location. 
and in 1910 they dug a cellar and they moved that house from Dewey Avenue to this location and set the house down on the cellar. Mm -hmm. And they also in the same year moved the barn. They okay, dug another too. cellar for the barn which was used for storing fruit in the winter in the winter time. There was a third barn which was almost sitting on the same property as my house today and they moved that barn from well it would be like on Dobson Road to Denise Road so they could get the barn closer to this to the road. That's so not this it, barn, right? No. Not in this photograph. Okay. I, I got some pictures of it. Okay. So is this is this anywhere in the vicinity of um Pizza Hut? Right? It would, Pizza Hut it would be the east, the east of Pizza Hut. Okay. But the, Pizza Hut would be where this house originally sat. But the barn that sat on my property was moved in the same year, so they moved the house and two barns okay. in 1910. And put cellars under all of them. That's wow. Tore them down and rebuilt them is what you're saying. No, no, they, no. They, they physically moved them. just rolled them. No, yeah. they just picked them up and, and wow. moved them. Probably with tractors. Yeah, timbers under them. Yeah, so them. Yeah. Wow. But look at the size of this house. This is no well, this, house this is no tiny little two-story house. When this house was originally moved, it just had one porch on it. Mm -hmm. And they added two more porches to it. On the site. Did your grandfather build it? No. It was the barn he built? Uh, my, my uncles built the barn you see behind the house there. We used to call it the horse barn. The horse barn, yeah. My uncles, who were the Lawsons, were barn builders, and they built that barn. It was all made out of cedar and uh, and chestnut. Oh, wow. And we're going to see some great photographs when we do Northgate. Here's the back end of the house. Um, the back entrance of the house was used mostly in the summertime. Up and on a summer day, Jane could be seen sitting on the porch churning her butter. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a clothes line to the left, as you can see the clothes just hanging off the, the line um, right off the photograph just beyond the sidewalk that leads to the outdoor two-hole cribbing. The reason why I put this in is I love, I love the description. Inside the outhouse, you could always find newspapers or a Sears robot catalog <laughs> in a box nailed to the wall. It was optional as to how these were used by a visitor. Sometimes a roll of toilet paper would actually be provided. <laughs> but this would have been written, what, in the, in the 60s? When did he write this? When did he write these words? I wrote those words. Oh, you wrote these. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought your brother wrote. Oh, Bob's the culprit. He's, he's the one with the sense of humor. Thank you, Bob, for being here today. So, here's, the, here's a picture of the family car. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, car aficionados. We haven't been able to identify what year this, this car is. Well, by. I showed these pictures to a friend of mine who has buddies that are car, car enthusiasts, and they think that it's a... About a 1925 or 26 Dodge. I got 25 or 20, it was, you know, late 20s, early 30s. That's as close as we could get. That sounds good. I like that ringtone. <laughs> okay, and here's one of my favorite photographs. This is pitching hay into the car, cow barn. Hay is being unloaded and lifted to the upper floor of the horse barn. A wagon load of hay or straw is parked underneath the lift. A large two-pronged fork is pushed deeply into the hay onto the wagon and locked into place with two handles. The forks were usually four or five feet in length, and a long rope would run between the fork to a pulley and rail arrangement that ran the entire length of the roof inside the barn. The rope runs outside the other end of the barn through another pulley on a rail and is attached to a horse or a tractor. So the signal would be given to haul up the load, as the load would travel up the rail, a trip line would be pulled to release the load from the fork and it would drop onto the floor inside the barn. A trip line is operated by the person who is unloading the wagon. But you can see how much hay is in one wagon load from the size of that guy who's pitching the, yeah, pitching the hail. Story to tell now. Yes. <laughs> I used to help my dad and my brother unload the hay. Either my brother or I would get up on top of the load and push the fork down into the hay and lock it into position. So I was up there doing it one day. I was maybe 12 or 13 years old at the time. And I was having a hard time locking the handles on the fork. 
and I was pushing and pushing and pushing. My dad was down on the ground, and he, he kept hollering up to me, you know, what's taking you? We haven't got all day. Hurry up and get that thing locked in. And then I made the mistake of saying, okay, okay. <laughs> my brother was on the pull on the uh, pull line on the other end of the barn. He heard me saying, okay. And so he let go. He figured it was time to pull the load up into the barn. So the load started going up, and I was still standing on top of it. So I, oh, no. I hung on for dear life. They got one heck of a ride along that rail because it goes fast. Once it oh, wow. once it gets the vertical part done, the horizontal ride really zips along that rail. So I hung on for dear life, and I got dropped at the other end of the barn. Fortunately, it was a lot of hay on the floor, so it was like falling out of the bed. Oh, this is very funny. And, and you looked at Tall the Tail, that's yeah, if you want that to hear, even better. If you want to hear another funny story, I can tell you one about bringing the hay in from the field. Sure. We had a thunderstorm on an afternoon, and normally when we were doing these jobs, a lot of the neighbors pitched in and helped, which was the way they did things back in the day. So we had the wagon loaded up. My brother and I were up on top of the wagon, and you kind of square off the load to keep it balanced right. And uh, there was a thunderstorm looming off in the west, so one of the neighbors said, well, we've got enough hay to maybe put another half a load up there, so why don't we do it? So we stacked the load higher than you normally would. So it was almost like riding on a big block of jello. It was bouncing up and down and going from side to side. We started to, I was driving the team of horses, and we were going down a dirt lane alongside of an apple and pear orchard, and you had to make a right turn, and the right turn went down into a little draw and then back up again. <laughs> so I'm standing there, and I'm turning the horses, and all of a sudden the horses stop. And I slap them with the reins, and they wouldn't move, and they just kept looking back at me like that. <laughs> And my dad was walking alongside the wagon, and he says, come on, get these horses moving. we got to get this hay in before the rain comes. And I'm slapping them and slapping them. My brother comes up behind me. He says, here, give me them reins. He says, I'll take care of them. And he starts slapping the horses, and the horses wouldn't move. All they kept doing is just looking back at us. So my dad says, okay. And he walked up, and he grabbed the halter on the horse on the right side, and I, I think it was, the horse's names were Amos and Andy, and I think that was Andy. And he says, come on, Andy, let's go, let's go. The horse took three steps, and the whole wagon tipped over. Oh. And my brother and I landed up in the top of, a, of an apple tree that was alongside the wagon. Oh, <laughs> so we had to clean up the whole mess. And, uh, Believe it or not, the rain never came. <laughs> and you don't know why the horses stopped. Well, well you they heard of the uh, you heard of the saying, uh, you know, having horse sense. Oh, well, the horses, they, they knew there were horses. Oh, the, 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 the horses knew that there was a problem, mm -hmm. but we didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's funny. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell them about the, the two barns there? This is during the snowstorm. Yeah, storm. you can see those uh, huge drifts there that were shoveled through. That was all done by hand. They used to shovel the driveway from the house out to the garage. The garage was the furthest building away from the house, 300 feet from the house to the garage, and that was all shoveled by hand. This was the uh, snowstorm of 1944, I believe. And, uh, you can see where that was all kind of cut up into blocks and thrown up in a pile, and that was all done by hand. Sometimes it would take two days to shovel the driveway from the house to the garage if the snow was deep. There's a fire. And this is the barn? Yeah, we, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, what we call the cow barn, because we used to have three cows on the main floor. And this is the one that we had a uh, fruit cellar under. We had, we had, uh, we could store three thousand or more bushels of apples or any anything else in there. And uh, and uh, this was, I think, on Halloween night or Halloween Eve. Eve. 
day in the afternoon, and some kids from Barnard School, 14, 15 years old, went up into the hayloft that we had on the back of the barn and set fire to it. <coughs> the Barnard Fire Department answered the call, and they came down, and I'll, I'll never forget seeing one of the firemen come up to the front door of that barn. You can see it's partially open there. And he took his axe and he swung the axe at the door to see if he could break through it. And the axe bounced off the door and came back and almost took his head off. And my brother was standing there and he says, Why you damn fool? He says, you're not going to break through that door. That door is almost three inches thick. He says, I can be, he says, I went around behind the barn before the fire got into that part of the barn and he unlocked the door, so all they had to do was slide it open. <laughs> in the meantime, I had a cousin that had 500 bushels of apples stored in the cellar of the barn. So we got all the neighbors together and formed a chain gang, and we went down in that basement and took all 500 bushels of apples out of the barn while the firemen were fighting the fire up above. When we were done, there was over a foot of water in the basement of the barn. But well, we saved all the apples. Now, did you, did you sell them locally or did you put them on the whole jack? I know you went to farm well, markets usually and sold them. Uh, you sold them market. Here. Okay. Because that was, uh, that was one of the questions that somebody asked me at one point. I said, you know what? I'll have to ask Bob. Next we, time. Used to, we had an old, real flatbed truck with a chain drive. And we used to load that thing up, especially when we had the peach harvest. We'd load that thing up, and we'd drive it back to our home on Dewey Avenue, and we'd take it to market at 4 o'clock in the morning. But the load was so heavy that we used to put jacks under the back of the truck and kept the load off the springs on the back of the truck until we were ready to drive it to market. And then we'd take the load up to market at 4 o'clock in the morning, the market opened at 6, and the, mm -hmm. the vendors wanted to have all their displays out by the time the market opened up. Here's a diagram of all the different crops. Tonight's road is down at the bottom. Once again, Dewey Avenue is over on the right-hand side. And who drew this? Your this brother? again was my brother's brother. Brother. Yeah, he drew exactly where everything was located when they you can see that dotted line, that uh, rectangular box. Yeah. That's the area where all the uh, Indian artifacts were found. That was a summer camp for the Seneca Indians that dated back from 2,000 to 6,000 years. And we've got a sample of the artifacts up here. Yeah, so under this is a close-up of that diagram showing where the apples were on the right-hand side, the different varieties. Here's oh, the house. Wow. There's one barn, there's the second barn. That's the, yeah, that's the barn. The garage. That's the garage. That yeah, was 300 about. feet from the garage to the house. Here's a photograph of Amos and Andy. <laughs> yeah, they were Belgian horses. And uh, they were named after the, the famous characters of the Amos and Andy radio show back in the 30s. Wow. And they're. Hauling the fertilizer, and, uh, that's right? A, that what thing in behind them that you see is a spray wagon. It had about a 150-gallon tank on it for sprays. And you stood up on that platform that you see on the top, and you sprayed everything by hand. That one's got the iron wheels on it yeah. still. We changed it from iron to rubber because the house that we lived in on Dewey Avenue was built in an old apple orchard and my dad wanted to take care of those apple trees so whenever it was time to spray we used to hitch up the tractor and drive the spray wagon all the way up to the other house and spray all the trees in that yard. Did you ever go on a vacation though? Never. No, I was going to say. When you're, when you're a farmer, no, you, you, don't you don't never get a day off unless it's Yeah, we did take one weekend trip up to the Adirondacks. Wow. Uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Here's some of the different varieties. These are this is an actual photograph of the of the trees, oh and this is the different varieties of apples that were grown. Well, back in those days, you didn't trim apple trees, and when they got a heavy load of apple, you didn't thin the trees either. When they got a heavy load on them like that, you just propped up the limbs with 
wooden <laughs> props. Nice. And we had hundreds of these props made up that we propped these apple trees up with. Are there any apples no longer in existence that weren't listed there? I don't know of oh. any. I Dad, did you have apple orchards? Yeah, but they all went in 1934. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what his They all froze. Don Luke comes from the Burns yeah, Newcomb house, of fire so they're the oldest farm in the town of Greece, mm -hmm. and the Dobsons would probably be the second. No, there's still a lot still. of them varieties around. I was wondering if any were non you know, non-existent now. Oh, no. Well, they could be, but most all the apples are still available. They're I mean, there's some that I've never heard of, but that, you know, like, well, yeah, they've, they've, I they've taken and most of those varieties now, and they've grafted them, them on the dwarf trees. So they don't get quite as big. Now, we had trees on the farm. They would grow 50 feet high, and they'd have a 40 or 50 foot spread on them. Wow. They had to pick them with extension lighters, 40 foot extension lighters. We've got more pictures of them here. Here's the props. You can see that on the, the photograph on the and the one on the left hand side. We used all this in the in the promo because that's wonderful. Here she is with two. Baskets, one in either hand and one on her head. <laughs> Who is that lady? I have no idea what her name was, but my dad used to talk about her, how she used to carry stuff on her head. Wow. That's, I mean, just, it's a priceless photo. But look at the and size those of the trees. Uh, those aren't 12-quart baskets. Those are 16-quart baskets. Yeah. What year did you wrap up the trees with the... Uh, with the forks there to hold up the limbs. Well, those were probably in between 1900 and 1920, back in that era there. Now, because my apple orchard on the Thayer farm, we didn't chop up anything. I thought I went out there at 5, 5.30 in the morning and started trimming up until noon time. Macintosh, uh, Baldwin's, Cortland's, and Welty's. Yeah. We never started trimming the apple trees until probably the 1940s. Yeah, that's then we about started right. trimming them. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Now, what would be the point or the benefit of trimming them? So well, that you could pick you the kept, harvest? You kept the trees thinned out, that way the apples got better color. Okay. And it would by getting more sunlight through the trees. Okay. And the apples also would get bigger. When you had a huge tree and just let it grow more or less wild, the apples stayed small. When you trimmed them down, you kept them within a reasonable distance of the ground. You let light through the trees. The apples were bigger, but you, you had less of them. But in the long run, you ended up almost with the same number of bushels in them. You can tell from people that either buy from farm markets or from Wegmans, we are asking stupid questions. No, we're not. You know, because, because we just we just are child like this. Yes. Now. We, yeah. Yeah. Don't, we don't understand what it's like. Farm, farm to table is the new it thing. It was but funny we back then. We had a roadside stand up on Dewey Avenue. And everybody that would come and buy anything from us, they'd always say, what variety is it? Even with corn, or even when we grew cabbage, they'd want to know what variety the cabbage was. Everybody wanted to know what variety. Nobody does that anymore. No. An apple's an apple, a cherry's a oh, cherry. Oh, no. well, this is great with the sour cherries. Look at those. Now, sour tell them about the, the baskets, buying them from Webster. Yeah, there used to be a, the Webster Basket Company, and they used to make all kinds of baskets and crates and everything. And we used to buy all of our uh, basket supplies from the Webster Basket Company. Sandy, where'd you get yours from? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, okay. You could buy the peck baskets for, I forget. No, because there was, no, a, there was a Cooper. A of, the, you know, big round ones. There was a Cooper in Chalot on Ladder Road. That's why I was asking him, because oh. it, he knows that they bought them from Webster, but there was Mulligan on, right. on Lanner Road in Chalot, so that would have been a lot closer to buy. All I know is after a rainstorm in a while, with a duster, which was an old Model T, and uh, we dust the trees for the fungus on the apples to keep the fungus off the apples right after the rainstorm. Yeah, back in the early days, you never, you never sprayed the trees like you do today. We only sprayed them about three or four times during the whole season. Right. Now you spray them almost every week. Why? Because of the more types of diseases get into them than they used to. Back then, about the only thing you worried about were worms and scab. Now you got all kinds of other things. Why? Why not? We used to prepare the apples for market. Believe it or not, the vendors at the public market 
you couldn't just dump the apples into a bushel basket and deliver them that way. They had to be fancy. So we had a special cover that you could set on a table and you lined up the apples in rings, concentric rings that were on this cover that they could fit the top of a bushel basket. And you'd line up your apples with the red cheeks down and then you had a metal cone that fit over that. And you put that metal cone over it, then you fill that up with your regular apples. Then you slid the bushel basket over the top of that metal cone. Then you picked the whole thing up and flipped it over. And then you took the metal <coughs> cone and the, and the cover off, and, I, and then you had nice rings of red-cheeked apples sticking up in the air. And that's the way you had to deliver them to the market. So now the vendor would come over, we'd unload all these beautiful looking bushel baskets of apples, the vendor would come over and dump them all out on the table. <laughs> Oh, we, we stored a lot of our apples on the Upton Cold Storage Company up on Yeah, the we stored yeah. a lot of ours up there, and also in Hilton. But there used to be a couple of tall <coughs> elevators in Shalott. One burned down, the other one fell over. That was at Patton Street. So Mr. Upton was the only one of the Uptons. Anybody remember where Ridgemont Country Club is now? That's the Upton House. That's the original yeah. farmhouse. So all of the Uptons moved to Spencerport except for Eli. Eli was the one who came down to Sherlock. He was opposite the Waters store, and he's the one who started the cold storage downtown. So and they went out to Hilton. They had that. Uh, they had a lot of storage facilities out in Hilton along the whole trip line, too, Upton cold storage. So downtown, if you look on the side of the building, you go down, what is it, White Street? If you look, you can still see E.M. Upton on the side of some of the brick. It's, they're still there. So now we're moving on to Frank Dobson. And in the fall of 1905, right after he became a citizen, he registered as a Republican and was elected to the Greece Board of Auditors. This started his career in politics. In 1907, he became uh, Peace Justice for the town. In 1910, he was elected Supervisor for the town of Greece. Um, in 15, he went to the New York State Assembly and served three consecutive two-year terms. Then he came home and was president of the school, bar, school board for Barter District Number 4. And then from 37 to 63, he served the town of Greece as Justice of the Peace. So everybody knew the Judge Dobson. My father was more or less self-educated. He never went beyond the eighth grade because he had to work the farm. But when he got interested in law, he studied the law books and, and uh, picked up advice from other magistrates and, and lawyers. And he got to the point where he could sit at his desk and even lawyers would come before him. And he would, the lawyer would question some of the interpretations of the law. And my dad would say, you go over there to where the law books are filed get volume number 10, turn to page 100, and look at the third paragraph, and that'll back up what I just said. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. He had them books memorized. Mm -hmm. I like this one on the right-hand side because this, he, he signed it um, 1924, and that was what you gave out to on your paper route. So oh. there's the silhouette of Frank Dobson, and that's his picture of the judge on the left-hand side. Now, he kept an autobiography, so a lot of the things that you're going to see over the next couple of slides are direct quotes from that autobiography. And had he started doing history for the town of Greece and then the village of Shalott, we never knew any of this stuff until it came time that we were doing this this uh, show, and then when Bob had these, I said, oh, this is wonderful because this is information that's never been seen before. Living in the country was lonely. There was no telephone, no electricity, no gas, no running water. No improved roads, and of course, no automobiles. We went to the post office in Sherlock to get the mail and to buy a newspaper. Um, a lot of the time, you will see 
like the fair farm, is listed as Shalat. Well, it was never in Shalat. It was always in the town of Greece. They listed you by the post office where you picked up your mail. So you were listed either as Shalat or Mount Reed was the next closest post office. So the Dobsons went and got their post office in Shalat. So if you see them on a map, it says that they live in Shalat. We went to the post office in Shalott to get the mail and to buy a newspaper once or twice a week. I read that in some states out west, farmers were getting their mail delivered by carriers. So I wrote to our congressman and was told we needed to circulate a petition for a route of not less than 25 miles in length. I contacted John Allen. John Allen was the local grocer across from the Waters store on the corner of River, which is now the Tate Con building. John Allen was the grocer, and he was also president of the village of Shalott. He was, at this time, postmaster. And we laid out a proposed route about 30 miles in length, and that was in the spring of 1900. So then I prepared a petition addressed to the fourth postmaster general in Washington asking for delivery service, and circulated the petition myself using a horse and a two-wheeled cart for transportation. Just about every farmer and householder on the route signed that petition. Some were in doubt about the government giving such service without paying for it in some way or another. We won't talk about the present election. <laughs> I was given the privilege of naming the first mail carrier, Leonard Billings, of Shalott, who had to make deliveries daily except for Sundays. He also had to furnish his own horse and buggy, and he got paid $500 a year. This is priceless information that historians never get to see, but this is some, you know, somebody's reminiscences, he's writing it in his diary, and so now here we are 100 years later being the benefit of it. Um, at this time, we're talking about delivering the mail. The only improved road and paved road in the town of Greece was Lana Road. That's because a supervisor lived there. <laughs> <laughs> and here's paving a Greece road in the old days. This is the Shalva. It's an old steam-powered excavator. And there's going to be another photograph after this. Um, the town of Greece was beginning to improve its highways under the Higby-Armstrong law. So if you were going to build a road, the supervisor would go and petition. The town would pay 15%, the county would pay 35 and the state of New York would pay 50% of the cost of the road. So this was a real popular way to you know, build roads back in the old days. Now, obviously, uh, the town of Greece was the biggest town, still is, in Monroe County, so they were flooded with petitions to have roads built all over the town. And among the first was Denise Road, obviously, because the supervisor lived there. Um, on which I lived. And by the way, I had something to do with it. The road was paved with crushed slag from the old Shalott glass furnace, which is at the northeast corner of Lake and Beach Avenue. Um, the road was 10 feet wide and rolled down with a 10-ton steamroller. That, of course, made for a very durable road in those days of horse and wagons. The Denise Road job was done by contract, and the entire cost of paving it from Lake Avenue to Dewey was less than $2,000. I know because I was the inspector on that job, and I was paid $3 a day for 10 hours of work each day. And here's the steam-powered shovel. Can you imagine digging a 10-foot wide road, how long it would take you to dig steam, with, that, with that shovel? The steam-powered shovel, and then you see a wagon there, which was actually a dump wagon drawn by a team of horses. But how many how many shovels would it take to fill that wagon? Probably a, two. I, I was going to say, that's such a dinky little wagon. It would take. Then they'd have to haul it off someplace. And and they actually back. had a trap door in the bottom that would open up to empty the oh, box. God. But these are priceless photographs of early equipment. Um, Assemblyman Dobson, when he served in the New York State Assembly, was also responsible for constructing the Stutson Street Bridge. This is an old photograph taken by Jack Foy. If any of you know Jack Foy, he's 90 years old. He a uh, veteran of the Battle of the Bulge, and he came back. He was an amateur pilot, so he went up and took photographs right when he came back from World War II in a little Piper Cub. This is the plaza which is still there at the corner. This is Lake Avenue. Here's Ladder Road going to the 
going to the river. Here's the land of each house. Here, this would be the post office, today's post office in Chalat. This is the plaza that's still there. This over here was another plaza which burned down. These were all little stores. And then the Waters Grocery Store was right here on the, on the uh, east corner of Ladder Road. And then the Tape Pad building, which was owned by Upton, is on the opposite corner, so the two corners there. So we're tying all of this in together with the history of the, of the Dobson Park. Yeah, a little short section of the Ladder Road that ran from Lake Avenue down yeah. to the river. They used to call it Skunk Howl. Yeah. Um, they still do it on yeah. Some of the old timers are still Yeah, you have to know where Skunk Hollow is. Yeah. And then over here, you see Arundicoit was not developed. The only thing over there was Waller Motors. And there's about three or four houses down there here. Considerable at, at amount the of swamp lands. Here. Yeah, so nothing was built up on the east side of the river at this point in time after World War II. Can you point again to the post office? Um, you go, when you go down Ladder Road, the, the new post office that's there today is right here. The land of each house, these the, the two corners, side to side. Library now, right? no, 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 no. It's the current post office, the Shalott Branch post office, and the land of each house has a coffee shop in it, coffee connection. Oh, yeah. And then you go down here, and then this would be the Tape Con building on the left hand side, and the Waters Grocery Store, the one that Mr. Sheridan bought his farm from. Waters Grocery Store is, it, it's called Scuttle, but it's closed now. Um, but that used to be, it was also Sam Leary's window bar, if anybody remembers from World War II, that was the, that was the window bar. So a very popular, you'd remember that Sammy, right? The window bar? Where's the new bridge across Stetson Street Bridge? Draw the with your pen there. <laughs> well, this is right the, alongside the. It was right alongside the. This, side. this this would be the old mm -hmm. one, it's, and the new one is. This part. is this would be the Parkway, so yeah. it's it's south of Scudson Street Bridge. Yeah. Okay, south. So okay. all of these houses were demolished to build the yeah. new right. Bridge. So it goes it's south. Okay. Another portion from the autobiography from Judge Dobson. Shortly after I took office in 1910, I found in my supervisor's office a petition that was signed by several hundred Shalott and vicinity residents asking that a bridge be constructed across the river from Shalott to Somerville. The petition had been presented to my predecessor, Mr. Frank Truesdale, who apparently did nothing about it. I presented the petition to the Board of Supervisors and the chairman appointed a bridge committee of five members with Louis Dubois from the Arundiquoit, he was the supervisor of the town of Arundiquoit, as chairman. We had several meetings with Monroe County Superintendent J.Y. McClintock, who was enthusiastically in favor of the plan. On June 23, 1913, the committee, together with a large number of Greece and Arundiquoit taxpayers, met on the east side of the river where the bridge now stands. And while we had a feast of hot dogs and lager beer, the gathering agreed that a bridge should be built on that site connecting Stutson Street on the west bank with Thomas Avenue on the east side. And the new road would be constructed across the marsh, across the Bee Tree Farm to St. Paul Boulevard. Now that's the way politics was done in the old days. Mm -hmm. Have a hot dog and a beer and a handshake would do it. Here's the dedication um, of the Stutson Street Bridge. This is... Judge Dobson shaking hands with Supervisor Dougal Boyce. Oh, I have one more thing I want to point out. If you look at the Stutson Street Bridge, these are wood planks. Mm -hmm. That was the original way the bridge was constructed. You can actually see the bridge is raised a little bit on the far yeah. side. And then we talked about J.Y. McClintock. He was the engineer who paved Stutson Street. This is this is the um, going up to the new O'Rourke Bridge. This is the old Stutson Street Bridge when it was originally constructed. The uh, wheelhouse was on the right hand side, on the Arundiquoit side. But all of these were two by two cubes. I went down when they excavated Stutson Street. We salvaged all of the cubes that were left underneath Stutson Street. These are up on Lake Avenue now. So I went down and took a picture of them. Um, and then if you go to the Stutson House, which is on Stutson Street today, we saved some of those bricks. The Stutson House uh, put them inside 
which is the old, um, help me here, Howell Grinder building. And it's called the Scottson House now. So it's the old Howell Grinder building. He put those on the wall, and if you look at the sidewalks on both sides of Scottson Street, we saved those bricks, and they're sunk down into the pavement of the sidewalk. Every 10 pieces of sidewalk or so, there's a little design with, with these. We tried to save as much as we could. And there's McClintock. He was originally a city engineer, then he became Monroe County engineer, and that's when he was in charge of building the bridge. Here's the original wheelhouse on the right-hand side. This is the, on the Arundiquoit side, and this is the plaque that has been salvaged. It's now sitting in the O'Rourke Bridge House uh, today, but this shows the bridge committee with the Board of Supervisors. Here's Google Voice, and here's F. Dobson on the top. It's, it's hard to read it here, but it says when, when the bridge was built, who built it, and we saved the plaque off of that. Then, obviously, it was moved to the, the west side and then taken down. So, in order to commemorate it, when they built the O'Rourke Bridge, we did the Bill Davis Overlook, which, for those of you who haven't been down there, you go to the end of Stutzen Street, where the bridge used to be, there's a series of ten plaques, and you can go down there. I was instrumental. In, with Bill Davis in terms of doing the design for this overlook and we got the city, the county, and the state of New York to provide us with this overlook because we wanted a museum. At that point, I was at the lighthouse. Well, the lighthouse is open for four months during the year and then it's closed and nobody gets to see it. Now you can go down every single day of the year and look at the ten plaques, provided there's no snow. You might have to brush off the snow, but you can see exactly what was down there at that point. We used the Christopher Blossom painting from 1863. So it's positioned so that if you look north, this is what you would have seen in 1863. And you can look across to a run see the boats that were being built. So this is the Stutzen Bridge sign. And I just, on a personal note, there's 10 signs and then two big gigantic ones that cost $6,000 a piece. This is the only sign that somebody has tried to steal. <laughs> in the 12 years that the bridge has been up, and somebody called me and they said, somebody took out the bottom panel of the Stutzen Street Bridge sign. I'm there at 7 o'clock in the morning taking that and putting it in the back seat of my car so that nobody would steal it. And then we had to set it to Missouri because they're the ones who, who prepared the frame. And it was gone for about two months. But that's the only sign, knock on wood, that nobody's ever stolen a sign from that. I'm sorry, where is that sign that you can... <laughs> at the end of Stutzen Street. The whole overlook okay. is where the right. Stutzen Street Bridge used to be. So you can go down there uh, today and, and see it. I mean, you had bollards installed and then two big uh, six-foot signs to talk, talk about the history of the village of Shalat. So here's, here's the big turnaround for the Dobson family was 1934, as Don mentioned before. And Sammy knows, too, that there was a huge, huge uh, ice <coughs> and severe frost that destroyed a majority of the fruit trees on that farm. Um, it went down to 22 below zero. Oh. Dad, how much, how much of your orchard survived that? None. Nothing? Everything died? No, we were what about you, Sammy? <laughs> I don't remember. I think we had some uh, heat, heat things in the, amongst the orchard, which would uh, radiate heat to keep an uh, orchard uh, from freezing, okay. or at least bring the temperature up. I think that's the only thing that saved us. The well, biggest amount of damage that that big freeze did was it made the tree, it killed the center yeah. part of the trees. And you know, a lot of the older trees, the younger trees survived, the older trees just hollowed out. So we used to spend many winters going out and cutting the trees down and then the way we got rid of the stumps is we'd blast the stumps out with dynamite. You could buy dynamite at the hardware store oh, at that time. <laughs> Uh, you put a half a stick of dynamite, dig a hole on one side of the tree, put a half a stick of dynamite in there and set the fuse, and it would explode, and what it would do is it would flip the stump over, and then you just throw a chain around it and pull it out. But there was one tree that was close to the log cabin that we evidently put a little bit too much dynamite under it, and when it exploded, it blew the stump clean out of the ground and it came down and 
landed on the roof of the log cabin <laughs> and cracked a lot of the rafters that were in the roof of the cabin. We had to repair those. <coughs> now, in 1932, I was born. I'm 84 today. In, in 1934, when well, I would have been two years old, but uh, I, I seem very vaguely we had those heat heat things in the orchard to keep it from freezing. Now, how the heck would I be two, pot? Uh, the heat yeah. pots? Yeah. yeah. How the heck would I be two years old and remember? And yeah. that sounds ridiculous. Oh no, no, it's <laughs> no. But your dad would have told you. Yeah. Well, that's at, why. At, at two years old. <laughs> no, it register. But they might have used it years later. Too. Yeah. yeah. I remember the dynamiting all because I. When you had elm, fun. elm tree. <laughs> Nothing you're going to forget too soon. No, yeah, elm tree where our farm was named after Elm Tree Farm. If you go down to the uh, New York City to the uh, auction bureau, there's two main auction sites on the fifth floor. If you get off the elevator, there's a picture of the elm tree from Rochester, New York that our farm was named after. And I remember well using a stick, a half a stick of dynamite to blow the stumps yeah. out of the ground all over all around the uh, elm tree, and uh, we had men at each end of Ladder Road and when we were dining man, he stopped the car, and this one guy didn't stop. He went right around the guy that was signaling with a red flag, and uh, we touched off a, a, a stump, and it went up in the air and came right down and landed right on the hood of his car and oh, drove, his, drove his wheels right into the ground, blew the front wheels. And I told him, I said, we told you to stop, you wouldn't stop. So the guy goes right down ladder road and ends up with that stump things. I remember that well. Then you had to no. go level all the land off after you after you blew them all the all the stumps out. And the Thayer farm went all the way from Ladder Road to Ling Road where the driving is, and then west, but probably a mile, almost a mile to the west. I would say halfway between Dewey Avenue and and Greenlee Road was the Thayer farm. So and all of that was organized. So um, the Dobsons hung on until about 1949, was what little was left of the trees. Um, and then they sold the majority of the farm to Emil Mueller, who uh, started constructing the very first shopping center in Monroe County, which was known as Northgate Plaza. So this is the only photograph that we have of him. It was taken out of the newspaper. That's why it's so bad. Um, and then the ad announcing in 1953 about Northgate Plaza being built. Kenny Farmer. So the history of Northgate is, is also a snapshot of what the town of Greece was in post-World War II. We take a lot of things for granted nowadays in the days of super malls, but back then, if you turn the clock back, the idea of a strip mall was a, was a big deal. The idea of a shopping center that would have 10, 15, 20 different stores was practically unheard of. Here's the ad from um, April of 1952 announcing the plans to build a new shopping center at Dewey Avenue. The article boasted it would be one of the largest in the eastern United States. The smallest store would be 500 square feet and the largest would be um, occupied by McCurdy's that would be 36,000 square feet and everywhere in between. And we tried to intersperse some of these. Like, Put a couple of ads in here from the original Northgate Plaza. And if you look here, here's the plaza, here's Dewey Avenue, and there's the nice road, and you can still see all of the Dobson buildings were still here in 1953. And here's a close up in the next one so that you can see. But if you look, there's nothing built. This is, you know, this is 1953, and none of these houses that are there now have been developed yet. I think Marwood Drive was the first development. Then Ripplewood and Shadowbrook came like 57, 58. Some of them were done by Flynn, some of them were done by Caldwell, Caldwell and Cook. So when did the farmhouse, the original house there on the corner finally down? It was in the early 60s, I think around 62, 61 or 62. The big farm houses? Yeah. And Northgate cost $2 million to build. 
It opened with 24 stores. And the big deal in 1953 was the fact that, you know, at this point, like you could go downtown and go to McCurdy's or, or Sibley's, but they didn't have any branches in the suburbs. So they were the first ones to branch out from downtown Rochester. Also, Scranton's came down there, Walkley and Powell, and they were the first ones to locate into the town of Greece. Here are the 24 original tenants oh. of Northgate Plaza. Now, the one that I'm curious about is Boylan's Northgate. Uh, we're trying to find somebody who knows what that is, because we don't we don't know. Every, everything else we've been able, uh, my in-laws still remember the German chocolate cake from Ebert's Bakery. They were there for years. And then the one that's near and dear to my heart is the last one on the right-hand side. It was Gray's Hobby. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that became wink and blink and a nod. And that's where my first that's where my first Barbie doll came from. <laughs> and it cost a dollar ninety eight. I still have the box and it says wink and blink and a nod. Then the biggest question I used to get when I used to do Northgate Plaza was, what about JC Penny? Well, that branch of the plaza was not even built yet. The plaza was built as an L. So it became a U and then Grants and Pennies came in afterwards in 1955, two years after the plaza was built. So it was not there so as you an original. Do you, know do you know what kind of store it was? Boylan's? Somebody had said a card shop, somebody said a grocery, and I'm going, but there was white and stars, so why would there be a third grocery store? So, but we were, it wasn't a woman's apparel shop. That was Raps. Raps okay. were, yeah, Raps were, where, and then there were a series of other ones there, but Boylan's is the only mystery one. 1956, the Times Union showed a sketch of the addition. And this is the part where pennies uh, would come in. And then they emerged and put in that back parking lot, which would hold another 4,000 cars. Western, Union, Western Auto and the Little Folks opened in time for the third anniversary in October. And then other stores would come in 1956. And the South Wing that be made it a U was Penny's, W.T. Grant's, Rudolph Jewelers. I remember <coughs> my mother getting a watch from Rudolph Jewelers. And the Endicott Johnson Shoe Store. Then, in my era, in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. Altiers, yeah. Radio Shack, Shed House, and the Crossroads Restaurant, which was there until it closed, yeah, was I there. I would say at that time, commercial lots, or I should say, the price of commercial property was only $2,000 an acre. There was a lot, a half acre lot sold next to my property just recently for $100,000. <coughs> and and Euler, he not only built, after Northgate, he built um, Titus Avenue, where Sibley was, he built that plaza. Over there, he also built the Twelve Corners Plaza, which is still there today. So he, he was he was a pioneer, um, but Northgate was always the first. And here's a picture of 1957, showing the north side. 56 Chevy there on the left. And well, there's a 57 over there, and the right hand side in front of Scranton's. Yeah. But you can't see. Ray's Hobby's over there in the corner, so you can't see it. And then here's, here's the Christmas shopping, 1957. There's three empty spaces in the lot. That's it. So, and here's the 57 convertible parked on the other side of Dewey Avenue. So you're looking right at McCurdy's. Probably the first traffic jam in the town of Greece, too. <laughs> Um, among the other firsts for Northgate Plaza, it was the first plaza in Monroe County to have a marquee. So you could walk from one end of the other, in case it was raining, you wouldn't get wet. That was also a novelty for its day. Also, Star Market was the first to have a stainless steel self-serve meat counter. That was the first self-serve meat counter. And now we take that kind of stuff for granted, but they were the very first ones in Monroe County. Um, this store had the largest frozen food selection in all of Rochester, and Northgate Plaza was its largest store for Star Market. 
Weidman's was also in the North End, but they, they weren't a big concern as of yet. Star was the biggie, and uh, Hearts, and, Hearts and Star. And then Loblaws came in, and Weidman's was the newbie on the block. But Weidman's pioneered the idea of him in a kitty corner. So they would, you know, mom would do the grocery shopping, but the kids could come, and you park them in the front of the uh, store, and they'd have comic books and little desks to keep the youngsters occupied. So one of the articles that I had showed Mr. and Mrs. Bob Weichman personally appeared in that, to inspect their facility with opening day with their children, Gail, Jean, and Danny, age mm -hmm. five. Hey, Bob, tell them a story about Mr. Weichman and your grandfather. I think that was uh, Bob Weichman's uncle had a roadside fruit stand uh, west of here, out near... Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mount Reed Boulevard, and uh, we used to sell him a lot of produce. And uh, because we were one of his exclusive uh, suppliers, he asked my dad one day if he wanted to go into a partnership with him. And my dad didn't think it was a very good idea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we could be millionaires, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Here's the first North Gate sign, which there are very few pictures of, and you see that we've reproduced it over there. I brought it in because that's one of the few things that did not sell at our auction yesterday evening, so that is available for purchase. Horse bar in the background. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's the roof of the horse barn. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. What auction? We had we had a silent auction. We had our pasta and dinner. A private thing. Well, no, we, we sold tickets. Oh, yeah, it was a fundraiser for yeah, the research historical. So, know. and that's one of the things. And I said, oh, good, I can bring it to the bring it to the um, gift shop. How much was it going for? Um, eighteen dollars. It's mounted and everything. It goes sixteen, uh, sixteen by twenty frame. Maybe you can buy so, it now. <laughs> yeah, we have to buy it now, Bryce. No problem. But anyways, that. And this is one of the very few photographs that we have of the second Northgate sign. Nobody liked this sign. No. But they tore down the first one. We don't know what happened to it. Huh. But that's one of the very... We don't, we don't know if they just wanted to replace it. It was new owners. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. you know, but the first one... I was going to say, the second one is not any great improvement over the yeah, first one. And everybody right. remembers the first one. You notice how full the parking lot is. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is later on. And then... Um, then the very newest customers became McDonald's, but you can still see that hamburgers and cheeseburgers were 39 and 49 cents in 1983 when they came. And then at the grand opening, Joe Altabelli showed up at the grand opening of the, of the Northgate McDonald's. Yeah, who said Carol's? Carol's Club were the best. Carol's was before a McDonald's. Oh, yeah, that was That's that why was I got about. confused. I thought, no, oh, okay, that's why. Well, no, Carol's was at the corner of Denise Road and Lake Avenue. Way before that, 83, right? Or no? What do you say? Yeah, but that, Carol's was, wasn't around in the plaza. They right, were already long gone, yeah. right? <laughs> but, yeah, they were at Denise and Lake Avenue. That was great. And then by oh, 2009, wow. you see how uh, far. <laughs> 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 yes, the seagulls. <laughs> <sea bells. laughs> All the cars that were replaced at Christmas time. Um, th in fact, this was taken in, in the winter time. And seagull. So, but the interesting part, and the reason why I put the photograph in uh, down here, the, when they were starting to tear down the plaza, huh. they uncovered the original Fanny Farmer yeah. sign. Uh, I love Fanny Farmer. Uh, so, oh, that was a great. They, they must have had 15 like stores in Rochester yeah, at one point in time. That's trouble. So when it came time, we wanted uh, we wanted a historic marker. And we wanted it to say the Dobson Farm. I'm going on record to say we lobbied to say the Dobson Farm, and we were turned down. So this is as close as we got. Um, Native Americans seasonally camped here. The 19th century saw this land being farmed by early settlers, uh, da, da, the Dobson family. The first major suburban plaza was built here in 1953. So this is the groundbreaking ceremony for when we um, Walmart to. came. Yeah, yeah so we might have gotten invited to. <laughs> when did Wegmans buy uh, buy it? Northgate. Wegmans didn't buy it. 
It was White Waters. Yeah. White Waters bought it. Is, like is that where the Walmart is? That that yes. Is what you're saying? Yes. And a lot of the yeah. neighbors oh, the petitioned. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Our, that's our picture window. Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. The garden. And yeah. then when the program is done, we can go up and look at this group of. Do you want to talk about the Indian heads and where you found them? About them sticking out of uh, the ground? Is, we didn't pull the, cher the cherry orchard. Uh, pretty near all the trees died. There was about four acres of cherry trees. And uh, about two acres of the land that the trees grew on was a little knoll that stood up above the rest of the ground. And when we pulled the trees out back in the 1940s, we started finding these Indian artifacts popping up to the surface. And every spring, when we'd plow that ground, we got to the point where you'd run a furrow, and then you'd get off the tractor and walk along the furrow looking for artifacts. And almost every time that you, you turned the soil over, you could find one or two. And over the years, uh, we collected probably a couple of hundred of them. And uh, these are some of the best out of the collection. And uh, it was an Indian, I, I showed these uh, arrowheads and spearheads to uh, an amateur archaeologist that worked at Xerox, and he took them to a professional and they went over them. And uh, the date for all of these artifacts go from around 1,500 to 2,000 years all the way back to about 6,000 years. So that was a, a uh, Seneca Indian summer camp, they figured. So they had to travel back and forth from wherever they had their winter quarters. One of them, I think, was at Letchworth Park. And there was another one someplace else in the Finger Lakes. And uh, that largest arrowhead, or it's actually a spearhead that you see in the center there, is white flint, or in, the, in the, most of the rock really isn't flint, it's called chert, which is very similar to flint. And the only place that comes from is the Finger Lake area. So that had to be, the rock had to be purchased down there, and then that particular artifact was found on the farm. And they didn't have horses back then, they had to walk that distance. And the other thing was, who is it, your mom? They had so many of yeah. these that they started. Had, they started giving them away to all the neighborhood kids. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. She thought anything that had no practical use was junk. So. She gave them away. So this this is all you have, right? Is what's in that? Well, no, I have a lot more, but most of them are broken. A lot. Of them, these are the the better ones. The cream of the crop. Yeah. I actually found one when I built my house on Dobson Road there, right across from where the Walmart store is now. And I was working up the yard to plant grass. I actually found one in the backyard. This is a picture of the Dobson plant and all the neighborhood kids at harvest time, which is why it was a perfect thing to put in our harvest program here um, for the next four weeks, because this shows them at harvest time. And J Judge Dobson is right over there. That's my okay. mother next to him. And then his future uh, wife, yeah, Martha. 30, 30 years younger. <laughs> then here's James Dobson and John. He's the one we saw with the sour cherries before. And then Jane, the only girl in the family. Here she is. The rest like cousins and stuff? They could be neighborhood oh, kids nice. for, for the farm. Yeah, because there were very few kids. Some most, of those, most of the Dobsons, they didn't even have kids. I they were married. Some of those the guys. kids were the Prestons. Some of them. Roger, J. Roger Dobson, is the one that's just to the right of the bucket there. That's, yeah. that's him, the baby. Yeah. Yeah, and his mother died young, so that's why. Yeah, she, died and, she died giving birth to him. Yeah, she was a, she was a tyrannist. So, and there were a Tiernan, there were, well, there's a Tiernan Street, Agnes, and they, Agnes, Agnes Tiernan, there were 16 Tiernans, they lived on the nice road. Quite a prolific family. <laughs> Maybe they were Catholic. Yeah. And then the part that I like is, you know, here we are doing this program, so if it weren't for families like Bob and Ann, you know, and 
the newcomers, the fairs, all of the people that allow us to use their photographs, then we're trying to save it for the next generation of people. So all that we have left for the names are the names of streets. Latta, Mount Reed, Larkin, McGuire, Beatty, Hogan, Britt. So we've got names. We've got stories of the families that go with all of us. And obviously, Dobson is commemorated because of Dobson Road. Which luckily, Bob, that's right north of Northgate Plaza. Where Taco Bell is the corner? <laughs> What's on the other corner? UPS store, right? Yeah. 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 Oh. And there's a hair salon there. Where the medical center used to be. I've been away a long time. Oh, well, but you got to remember Northgate Plaza. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's I was the city girl. So oh, yeah. okay. Well, I was too, but everybody, I learned to drive in the back of Northgate Plaza. And which, which, everybody did. But the, but the thing is, that's, that's how I started becoming interested. When I would go, I would go up to the Yates Fair Farm, up at Greenleaf, because I lived on the cheap side of Beach Avenue, and my mother would, you know, Take that 57 Chevy, I call it the Christine car, the, the red thing with the fins, and you know, we would go up there, and that's where she taught me how to drive, and I never could drive a, a stick shift. Well, this has been so, wonderful. Thank you very much, Nevada and Ann, for saving it. Please, well, I'm sorry for the problem, and before you go and uh, help yourself, you know, since we're an all volunteer organization, what we have to do in order to keep the lights on is pass the hat in case anybody would like to make a donation. So we actually pass a physical hat. So it helps us um, with our $20,000 bill to keep the lights on. So we'll pass this around. Please help yourself and come up with a little bit more events. Yes.